Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Johns Hopkins School of Education Master of Science and Counseling virtual webinar. My name is Tyree Maddox, and I'm the admissions coordinator at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Also presenting today, I have my colleague from the Office of Admissions, Sion Jung, who is the Assistant Director of Admissions. In addition, our faculty, Dr. Ileana Gonzalez and Dr. Sterling Travis, as well as our guest student speaker, Jin Wan Su, will also be joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. First, today's webinar is being recorded, so we will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. Please take a second to see if your mic is on mute right now. Please have your mic on mute and video off at all times on the presentation. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please type your questions in the chat box at that time and we will read and answer your questions. I would like to share the agenda for today's virtual webinar. We will kick off the presentation sharing an overview of the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Then our faculty will go over the details of the, of the counseling program. Lastly, I'll wrap up the admissions requirements and leave the floor open for questions at the end. Again, please keep in mind to type your questions in the chat box at the end of the presentation. So to start, some quick facts about Johns Hopkins University School of Education. We are one of nine schools at the Johns Hopkins University, and we began offering college courses for teachers in 1909 and then became our own school in 2007. We are proud to share that the Johns Hopkins School of Education is consistently ranked one of the top schools in education by the U.S. News and World Report. For enrollment, we have approximately 2,367 students, 121 full-time faculty, and 27 graduate programs, which include doctoral, master's, and graduate certificate programs. We also have a strong network of over 2,200 School of Education alums. For faculty introductions, our first faculty presenter will be Dr. Ileana Gonzalez. She's the assistant professor in the counseling department, has a PhD from University of Maryland. Her research interest includes urban school counselors and social justice and social justice related issues in counselor education. She's a member of the American Counseling Association, the Association of Counselor Education and Supervision, Chi Sigma Iota International Counseling Honor Society, Counselors for Social Justice and the Association of Multicultural Counseling Development. She's a former chapter faculty advisor for the Johns Hopkins University Lambda chapter of CSI. She was also named Counselor Education of the Year by Maryland Counseling Association in 2020. Next, we have Dr. Sterling Travis, who is the Assistant Professor in the Counseling Department as well. His PhD is from the College of William and Mary. His research interests include individual psychology, evidence-based practices, and college student development. Dr. Travis has extensive clinical experience working with children, adolescents, and adults in a variety of settings. Before joining the faculty at Hopkins, he served as the clinical director of a specialty hospital system for the treatment of eating disorders. He has served as a counselor at several university counseling centers and has worked in private practice in several grant funded counseling centers. He's a licensed professional counselor and a national certified counselor. Dr. Sterling currently serves on the board of directors of the North American Society of Alurion Psychology. And now I'd like to pass it on to our faculty. Hi, everybody out there. Welcome. I, the counselor in me has to turn at least my camera on so that you know that I'm a real person um, talking to you all and not just a photograph. So I appreciate um, all of you joining at least uh, this afternoon where we are in the world. Um, on the East Coast uh, in the Baltimore area. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to get to know more about us and our program. Um, and on behalf of Dr. Travis and I, we hope that this session is really informative to all of you um, as you make your decisions uh, and invest in something that is the most important, which is you and your education um, and this uh, wonderful profession. Uh, of counseling. Obviously, we are a little biased, but um, nonetheless, we'll talk a little bit about our program. So our program is divided into two specialty areas, um, and that is school counseling um, and clinical mental health counseling. Um, I uh, 
have, am a former school counselor um, and I teach uh, predominantly on the school counseling side um, with my experience, although of course I teach across the program. Um, and I know that Dr. Tr uh, Travis's experience is in the, in the clinical mental health. So you have two folks representative of each um, area of our department. What you see there is a photograph of our education building. Um, it is located in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, the first question we always get is, are the classes face-to-face -face now? What's going on with COVID? So let me start by saying that we are face-to-face -face right now. Um, we are doing our classes in person. Um, as a matter of fact, I think Dr. Travis is in the Ed building because his memory serves me correctly. He teaches tonight. Um, so um, we are having classes face-to-face -face, and that is the move going forward. Um, of course, we had COVID protocols in the building with masks and testing, uh, et cetera. Um, but we, the plan is as we move forward to continue to offer face-to-face -face courses. Um, our course is predominantly online um, and we've moved a lot of online courses back to face-to-face. -to -face. So um, uh, as you apply to the program and make uh, plans to come to the program, you can plan on going to that building right there that you see um, in that photograph down on the right-hand side of your screen, which is uh, exactly where Dr. Travis is right now. Um, that is our education building where all of our counseling classes are housed. Next slide. All right, and uh, I wanna echo uh, Dr. Gonzalez is welcome to y'all, uh, joining us from wherever you all are in the world. Uh, I'm very excited that y'all are here to uh, learn a little bit more about our program. and. One of the things that uh, we pride ourselves on uh, is living by our mission statement. And so we always feel like it's a good idea to share with you all uh, the mission uh, of our that we hold in our counseling program here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and so just reading this through with you is that the, the mission of the Johns Hopkins School of Education, Counseling and Human Development Program is to prepare graduate students to serve as socially just school counselors and clinical mental health counselors who implement theoretical empirical and practical frameworks that facilitate client growth and development, introspective awareness and well-being in a global society. And one of the areas that I think is just very important to, to highlight and that we hold a lot of pride of in our program is the at the seat of our mission statement of that idea of being able to develop counselors that are socially just. Uh, this is in the fabric of our program, focusing heavily on the development of counselors who strive to be socially just counselors and besides in cultural competence, cultural humility, advocacy, and empowerment to the clients that they serve. Uh, and that is uh, not only in uh, individual courses on social justice and diversity, but also throughout our entire programmatic uh, development of our courses is that we really pride ourselves in emphasizing the social just uh, counselors that we're developing. And so if you can go to the next slide, please. And so as Dr. Gonzalez shared, we do have two separate programs. Uh, they are both masters of science. Uh, they, uh, the two different specialty areas are school counseling, um, focused on the clinical practice in school settings, uh, and then the clinical mental health counseling uh, side of things, which focuses more on the general practice of mental health counseling uh, in the general sense. So working in the community, uh, does that mean that uh, clinical mental health counselors don't sometimes serve uh, with and alongside in school settings, uh, alongside school counselors, but just in a more general uh, practice. And we'll get into some of the other areas that uh, some of our graduates have worked in a little bit later in the, in the presentation. But these are our two programs, the Master's of Science in School Counseling and the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program. All right, and so I think this slide also uh, starts off with me and then uh, Dr. Gonzalez will talk a little bit <laughs> counseling side of things. Uh, but so this is our full-time uh, breakdown of our courses. Uh, if you look on the left-hand side of this slide, if you're interested in the clinical mental health counseling uh, program, uh, this is really the outline of our program of how we set it up based on uh, each year and each semester. Uh, you'll notice in the very beginning of the program, it's much more of a foundational knowledge, uh, the courses that you're developing and developing that foundational competency before you head out into the field, which begins in the second half of your second year. Um, starting off in the program, we immediately wanna work with counselors to develop the understanding of uh, the counseling theories and counseling skills that we utilize as counselors. Uh, as well as introducing you to the field and the different professional organizations and the different uh, components of clinical mental health counseling, as well as also at a very beginning level, we want to make sure that students emphasize and understand the impact that development 
has on an individual's progress and who they are as an individual developing uh, within their, their society. And then as they move along uh, into the second semester, we start to focus still on some of the foundational knowledge considering um, diagnosis and psychopathology, understanding not only the diagnostic systems that are utilized in counseling, utilizing things like the DSM-5 um, to conceptualize a diagnosis, but also in our psychopathology course, thinking about how do we actually take that information incorporated in theory, as well as developmental understandings to develop treatment planning to meet clients where they are and to develop a treatment plan that satisfies those needs, um, as well as also focusing in some of the specialty areas with career and life uh, uh, and life development planning uh, come in, but then also as I've said earlier, we focus on diversity and social justice in all of our courses. However, in this program, we want to make sure that we have very specific time where we will focus on developing cultural competency uh, and cultural humility and advocacy in our students at a very early stage in the program. And as you move into your second year, uh, we focus a little bit more onto some of the application and specialty areas, things like couples and family counseling, um, cognitive behavioral counseling, uh, excuse me, cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as group counseling. Now, one thing to note uh, is that even though CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is a course that we offer, we are not necessarily training all counselors to be cognitive behavioral therapists. Uh, we have an area of focus uh, in training students around that because we, we know that it is something that is very largely talked about in the mental health uh, counseling world, but that course does not limit our students to just being cognitive behavioral therapists. Uh, we encourage students to develop their own uh, theoretical identities that match the clients needs that they're going to be working with. And so that's an important thing to note there. Then as you move into the second semester of your, uh, your uh, second year is when you start to have the field experience that continues on to your third year. But in practicum, uh, we start to actually start to do some of this clinical practice out in the community working with clients, um, as well as also continuing some of that specialty training and things like addictions and appraisal on how to use assessments uh, when you're out in the field. Then your third year is really focused on field experience. You have two additional courses in, another, in an elective, as well as also in uh, research of learning how to interpret and conduct research. But during that field experience, the, that time during your third year is really focused in on conducting the clinical practice uh, and working in the field and getting supervision and feedback on the work that you are doing. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Gonzalez to talk about some of the differences that are in the school counseling. Program. Yeah, I think I think you got it pretty, pretty well there, Dr. Travis. Uh, our program for you all to know, um, regardless of what track, um, when you come into the program, if you're accepted into the program, you will work with an academic advisor who will review with you your program plan and you can make decisions on if you want to do the, the program, excuse me, full time or on a part time basis. Doing the program full time requires three full years. Um, no, we do not uh, have courses during the summer and that is purposeful so that students can get involved uh, conducting research, doing presentations, um, volunteering at different organizations, uh, honing in on their counseling skills. So um, we do not offer classes during the summer because of other opportunities. Um, however, what you'll note is you're gonna see across the board uh, with school counseling and clinical mental health is the courses are very similar save for a few. Um, in the first semester, while clinical mental health uh, counseling students are taking intro to clinical mental health, um, school counseling students are taking foundations of school counseling. Um, while clinical mental health students are taking psychopathology in the spring, um, school counseling students are taking counseling adolescents and children. So there is some differences, and I always get asked the question, so is it like these students never interact with one another, right? Is it, you know, and that's not the case. All of the courses um, you are with other students, you're with clinical mental health counseling and school counseling together because this is the profession. The techniques are the same, the theory is the same, uh, the context in which you apply it, of course, is very different. Um, and that's why we have some of those specialized courses. Um, but um, the courses are together. Um, right now, I teach a counseling techniques course for our brand new students that just started the program and about 30% of them are school counseling students and the rest are clinical mental health counseling students. So you will be with other students um, within the program. Uh, I should say other students in the other specialty within the program. Um, and it works on in. Um, and you can also do this program on a part-time basis if you all wanna go to the other slide. Um, 
the major differences that we'll see in this is just the time extension. Um, what you notice now, instead of three years, it becomes now four years. And this is for our students that may have other things going on. They may need to work. Um, they may uh, be starting uh, families. They may have other needs. Um, and so the program offers the opportunity and the flexibility um, to do it on a full-time basis and take about four classes a semester, or do it on a part-time basis and take about two classes a semester. And my advisees ask me all the time, well, right now I'm really busy, but in the spring I plan on quitting my job. Can I start full-time or am I married to a part-timer? That's why you have advisors. We'll work with you based on where you are in the world, um, if you need to advance a little bit or if you need to slow down a little bit. Um, that's the beauty of our program. It offers that flexibility. But the sequence is always the same. The sequence is pur uh, purposeful and it builds one upon, the, one course builds upon the other and it's built upon the other and one semester, excuse me, is the prerequisite for other semesters in terms of the skill set that you are developing right on into your field experience. And field experience is considered what's called practicum and internship. As Dr. Travis pointed out, it starts if you're full time, the second semester of your second year and into your third year, if you're part time, it begins um, the third, your third year um, and then on into your fourth year. So um, there, there, these field experiences that you have are opportunities to work alongside uh, different agencies, schools, et cetera, and work across real life clients. Um, but before we get there, obviously, you need all the prerequisite skill set, um, the didactic knowledge, um, the practice that you will do in some of these courses that are called lab courses, where you'll get an opportunity um, to have a quote mock client and work with other students in the program or other students in the class to practice your counseling skills. Obviously, this is purposeful and obviously ethical. Um, we're not going to put you out there in front of clients until you're ready. Um, and speaking of being ready, if you want to flip the slide, or Dr. Travis, I don't know if you had anything else to say about this part-time. No, no, I think you covered um, some of the pieces that I might have gleaned over, and I really appreciate that, especially the, the idea of that staying on sequence and talking about with the advisor is that one of yeah. the things, uh, when talking about sharing the course sequence is that there's been a lot of thought that has gone into this of what develops and moves into one another and why the prerequisites are in the places that they are. And your advisor really works with you to make sure that it's something that is at a comfortable pace, but that you are able to stay on, uh, which is really important. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's talk a little bit about these clinical experiences. Um, the first one that you all will encounter is practicum. Um, practicum is your introduction into clinical spaces, whether that is um, whether you're a school counseling student and that is at a school, a K through 12 space, public school, um, or whether that's your clinical mental health. And we have lots of different um, organizations and agencies um, that we work with that we can certainly talk about a little bit later. Um, but this is 100 hours of clinical experience that you will get via the practicum experience. Um, this is a class, there's a class that goes along with it that is what's called supervision. So you'll come into class once, as a matter of fact, I teach that class this evening. Um, and so you will have um, experience with other students that are in the practicum experience, along with um, a professor to talk about those experience and other assignments. 40 of those hours will be in direct service with clients, whether it's in the individual or group counseling modality. And 60 will be indirect on site and within the supervision course. Um, and of course, there are um, assignments um, associated with the practicum that includes, you know, integration of theory into practice, case conceptualizations, treatment planning, um, modalities of uh, delivery of services. But this is your introduction um, into the profession in a, in a, a short one semester, 100 hours. Um, in a space. We have an incredible field experience office within our program. Um, and we have uh, a woman by the name of Dar uh, Darlene Connolly, who's our field experience coordinator. And she handles all of this in terms of the process for placement for all of our students, thinking about where they want to be, the application process for practicum and internship, which we'll go to uh, in just a little bit. Um, but um, there is an entire process associated with this if you are accepted into a program, we will not 
um, throw you out there to figure it out for yourself. Of course, this is a process um, that, that we will work with you on in terms of being placed. And I think um, being in the Baltimore area, the greater uh, DC Baltimore area, there are so, 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 so many opportunities to work in the field, um, especially I can, I'll speak on the school side um, in our K-12 spaces. Um, we have, of course, elementary and secondary schools, and we work with one, two, three, four, five, uh, probably around six or seven different districts ranging all the way from Northern Virginia um, into uh, Northern Maryland. Um, so if you're familiar with this area, we, we work with a lot of different districts that are both urban and suburban in nature. Um, and uh, we have a number of school counselors out there that are amazing site supervisors that work with our students. Dr. Travis, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about some of our sites. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll chime in with the clinical mental health side of things because, uh, and I'll echo entirely when talking about the office uh, that Darlene Connolly holds and uh, Dr. Lauka, our, our field experience office, uh, truly work really, really diligently in, uh, in considering placements and assisting students with getting uh, to finding practicum and internship sites. Um, one of the things uh, that I would also add in, and, and, and this is one of the differences between school counseling and clinical mental health counseling, and um, Dr. Gonzalez shared the idea of placement. Um, placement happens in the school counseling side of things in the relationships with the districts. One of the things with clinical mental health counseling, because we know that our students have a variety of interests and populations they wanna work with. And so students actually on the clinical mental health counseling side, are provided with lists of the sites that we have already gone through and vetted. And that list is provided for students to reach out and, and establish those relationships of where they would like to work. But also if let's say you had an interest in working with a population that wasn't on our approved site list is the term that is used, then you are able to reach out and say, I'd like to see if we can get this site approved. And through that office with Darlene Conley, they'll go out and interview the supervisors and see what the site offers to be able to see if it can actually meet those needs that fit our requirements of what the site needs to provide because we also don't want students to be at sites where they're not actually having really positive experiences and so making sure that that, that is all vetted really clearly and so that's another thing that comes from that capacity we have sites uh ranging from Virginia to the Maryland area, DC as well. Um, I think we've had some students uh, operate in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so there's a little bit larger birth of area that, uh, that in clinical mental health, uh, because there's being able to find sites where individuals want to tra uh, travel to. Uh, and so we have students that have worked in hospital settings. We've had students that have worked in uh, private practice, group practices, community service boards, uh, very specialty areas. So I'm working with specific modalities such as dialectical behavioral therapy or substance abuse centers, uh, eating disorder treatment centers. There's really a large variety uh, of where our students are working in their clinical practice, college counseling centers. Um, and so really there's a lot of area for students to be working in that already are approved as well as also if there's a, a, a site that you're interested in working with or you built a relationship with or are interested in the work that they're doing, that also is a possibility as well uh, in field experience. But in the practicum side of things, it does mirror on both sides that 100 hours as the minimum requirement while you're in uh, your first semester of doing field experience as a practicum student to be looking at 40 hours of direct client service and 60 hours of indirect client service um, and with supervision happening uh, on site as well as in the uh, in the faculty component of having a faculty supervisor as well. If we can go on to the next slide, I can talk a little bit about the internship side of things or oh, this one's actually on on uh, the school counseling. So if you want to take that, Dr. Gonzalez. Sure, sure. While you were talking, I was trying to answer some of the questions in the chat. So please uh, feel free folks to answer some of those or to ask some of those questions in the chat if something isn't clear. Um, so again, as we talked about the practicum being a 100 hour experience, your internship is a 600 hour experience. So that is completed over two semesters. Uh, it typically works out to about two and a half days out of school, um, working with a site supervisor. Um, so, uh, it, it typically happens uh, in the fall and in the spring. So it's one full year where you will be at an internship. Some districts, without getting into the weeds a little bit, but some school districts, do require a switch of school halfway through the year. Some districts don't. Some districts want you to maintain that continuity and stay at the same site for both. Um, so it just really depends on what district you choose to be in as part of your clinical experience uh, within schools. Folks always ask, 
Can I pick the school? Unfortunately not, you cannot pick the school. You can pick the district that you would like to be placed in. Typically folks pick that based on geography, you know, what's close to them, where they live, or what areas they're familiar with, um, but you cannot pick the school. We also get the question, well, I'm a teacher. Can I do it at the school that I work at? And the answer is absolutely not. It is unethical. Um, it is what's called a dual relationship. And um, dual relationship means that you have another relationship with a student beyond being a counselor to them. Um, so that runs into a lot of ethical dilemmas that we try to protect you from as an intern. So the answer to that um, is absolutely um, not. If you wanna go on to the next slide. I think this is about clinical, yeah. All right. So uh, on the internship side of things and in, uh, in clinical mental health counseling, it is uh, the minimum hours of 600 uh, hours that you're going to be working towards, six credits. Uh, and so on the clinical mental health counseling side of things, this is the two semesters, uh, so fall into spring. Um, in this process, it's a continuation of practicum and that you're continuing to do field experience. That does not mean that students uh, remain at the same site that they were at for practicum. You can if you are at a site that practicum and you're liking the experience that you're having uh, and are getting the experience um, that you want, you can stay there. There's also students sometimes even enjoy what they're doing at practicum, but they want just a little bit of a different experience. And so they decide they want to switch sites when they're going for their uh, their internship. Uh, all of that goes through the application process. Um, that, you're, that you go through and, and getting the site approved and things along those lines. Um, but during the 600 hours, 240 of those hours are direct client service, so meaning that you're sitting face to face with a client uh, and the remaining fall underneath of the supervision that you're receiving or the indirect client services. And when we mean indirect hours, we're talking about some of the administrative duties, if that's things like note taking, uh, working on developing curriculum for a program that you're going to be running on site, uh, or going and uh, making consultations with other providers and things along those lines, all fall underneath of the indirect service. Um, this is completed, as we've said, over two semesters. Um, typically, that's going to be fall to spring. Uh, I saw that there was a question about uh, internships going over summer, but during our program plan, the way that it's set up is that the practicum is in, is in the spring, then there's the break over the summer, and then fall to spring uh, of that last year is when you're in field experience. Uh, there is a process of being able to have uh, approval during that gap period between fall and spring semester if you're staying on site. Um, but so uh, cur uh, current uh, during the summer between practicum uh, and internship, that time is off. Um, and so that's, uh, that's how things are currently set up. Um, but that's the, the clarity of the internship and clinical mental health counseling side. So if we can go on to the next slide. All right, let's talk about these two words, certification and licensure. They are very different words, meaning very different things. And I already see two questions in the chat about uh, licensure. So Dr. Travis, I'll give you some time to answer those since Mm -hmm. You are the licensure expert. So let's talk about the difference between certification and licensure. So folks out there that are interested in practicing as a school counselor solely and only, the word is certification. Um, the, the word to practice as a school counselor in states is called certification, except for one state, and that is the state of Virginia. Virginia actually calls um, certification for school counselor. They, they are the only state in the nation that actually calls it license, licensure, excuse me. But the majority of states, what they're gonna call it is certification, much like a teacher. When I was a former elementary school teacher, um, you have to get certified to teach. Same thing, you've gotta get certified to be a school counselor. Now, our degree has what's called reciprocity. That means no matter where you go in the country, a school counseling or a degree, a master's degree from our program is a master's degree in counseling anywhere in the country. So you'll be okay there. Now, in order to um, get certified in different states, there are different things that you have to do. And each state's board of education has their own, um, uh, their own requirements for you to get certification. And it varies from state to state and it varies into what kind of program you were in, if your program was KCREP accredited or not, we are KCREP accredited. Um, so each state has their own thing in terms of what is the certification process for school counselors. Now, those of you out there that are interested in school counseling, I invite you to go to this website on the screen, it's called schoolcounselor.org. 
If you don't remember that, you just have to remember four letters, A-S-C-A, ASCA, American School Counseling Association. You can type that into a Google, it'll take in a, into a Google search, it'll take you right to the American School Counseling Association website. What they have there is a tab that lists every state and US territory and what exactly are the requirements for certification to be a school counselor. In the state of Maryland, all you need to do is apply and come out of a KCREP accredited program. So for those of you that wanna stay on in the state of Maryland, it's pretty easy. It's a pretty simple uh, process in order to get certified. Some other states require maybe some things like an online course in child abuse, um, I've heard of some states in the Midwest, I can't remember if it was Ohio, um, or I can't remember what state it was exactly, um, that there was an additional examination um, that's needed. So again, and these are constantly changing, of course, as state uh, departments of education, the legislatures meet, they might change things here and there. Um, so I invite you again to check on that website. Now, Licensure for clinical mental health folks or folks interested in earning licensure is a little bit more complicated. So I'll let Dr. Travis handle that. Yeah, and I, and I think some of the uh, the questions that you all are asking in the chat, I'll try and cover some of those as we're, we're talking through licensure right now. So one of the first things is that so um, as a graduate of a program, uh, so with you see this, the National, National Counselor Examination, that is something that you're prepared to take as a um, as a uh, graduate of the program, the National Counselor Examination that would lead to the National Counselor Certification. And so that certification certifies that you have competency in the areas outlined in, uh, in that exam. Now, licensure in counseling varies state by state. There is not reciprocity of a one license sort of piece. So I'm licensed in both Virginia and Maryland, which means I can practice in both those states, but DC right in the middle, I cannot practice there because I'm not licensed there doesn't mean that I couldn't apply for that licensure, but it means that there's not reciprocity. I can't just move with my license. You have to be licensed in each state. Now, speaking specifically to Maryland, uh, is that in Maryland, after you graduate from a program, is that you would apply for what is called the Licensed Graduate Professional Counselor, the LGPC. And so different states have different ways of titling this. In Virginia, it's called a resident in counseling. Some call it an, an associate professional counselor. It depends on the state and the title they're going to be using. But typically, the requirements of those licensures at the graduate level is that you have completed a graduate program and have completed the field experience that is needed in practicum and an internship. And so once you've gone into the LGPC, during that time, you are accruing additional clinical hours and continuing your education through professional development. Now, those continuing hours, just speaking about the, the state of Maryland, is that there need, you need to have a total of 3,000 hours of clinical service to apply for the LCPC, which is the full licensure that you are awarded once you have reached that 3,000 hours. Now, one of the questions asking about do the 600 hours count towards your LCPC when you are applying for that in the state of Maryland? That's a great question. Um, so the hours that you accrue during your graduate program do count towards licensure up to a point. So in the state of Maryland, you can count up to 1,000 hours of practice from while you are in your graduate program. So one of the things is that also if you're adding up is that during internship in clinical mental health counseling, you accrue 600 hours during practicum, you accrue 100 hours. So meaning that when you graduate from a program, if you have done just the minimum, then you can count up to 700 hours towards your licensure when you're applying for the LCPC. Now, that also with the internship being 600 hours, that is a minimum. So you could go ahead and get 800 hours working really hard and getting those hours in. And then you have your additional 100 from practicum, that's 900 hours. You could do 900 hours in internship and the additional 100 from practicum and have 1,000 hours. It just depends on how much you work, but the minimum if you complete both internship and practicum, would be able to count 700 hours towards licensure. Uh, and so with that licensure, when you are fully licensed, then you can practice without being under supervision. So while you are at the licensed graduate professional counseling level, you have a board approved supervisor that is continuing your supervision outside of what you have done already in your graduate program. So those additional uh, hours you have to get to that total 3,000 uh, 3, you're continuing to have supervision during that time because technically your clients will be underneath of the supervisor's licensure via you. 
And so that's, uh, that's some of the licensure process. So you apply for the licensed graduates right after you graduate. And then after you've completed your 3000 supervised hours, then you would apply for the LCPC. Okay. I think I addressed those, the, the questions that have come up, but that's the, uh, the licensure process. And you are prepared to go into the licensure uh, after uh, graduating from, uh, from a K-Crop accredited program. So if we want to go on the next slide. Yeah, so I'll talk about this briefly. And as Dr. Travis mentioned, um, the uh, we do have students that um, are in that come from other programs or maybe started other programs, their licensure ran out, or maybe they need specific courses for licensure. So in addition, we have some graduate certificate programs uh, called the CAG, Certificate of Advanced Graduate Study. Um, or a post-master certificate uh, in clinical mental health counseling for folks that maybe didn't have those required courses needed for licensure from another program. So this is something else that we offer and some of you may be interested in that program because you may have accrued a master's degree in counseling from someplace else um, and are needing these courses for a licensure. If you wanna go on to the next slide. I can talk about this, Dr. Travis, because I think you're answering some questions um, answer in the question. chat. I'm going to do this. Yeah. Cool I'll jump back over the clock. Sure, sure, sure. So we get a lot of questions about, OK, so what happens after graduation, after this certification and licensure process? Um, what happens to students? Where do they go? Um, and a majority of our students go right into the field. Um, school counseling students in particular work at elementary, middle and high schools college career centers, uh, private organizations that are connected to different school districts, private schools, charter schools, NGOs, um, and community organizations. And also many of folks go into a PhD program um, that they may be interested in as well. And we'll talk about that, I think, in the uh, future slides, but we do have a lot of our students as well that go on to a PhD in different programs. If you wanna talk about the clinical side. Yeah, uh, thank you. I was trying to answer one of these questions, um, in which you all are having great questions in the uh, in the, the chat. So the clinical mental health counseling side, as I think, as I mentioned earlier, is that we have students that have gone on to take up careers in a variety of settings from private practice and private practice is really hanging your license and being able to meet with clients uh, and having the caseload exclusively in a private practice setting. Uh, some go on to work in general in psychiatric hospitals or just hospital settings in general. Um, pain clinics, uh, outpatient clinics, more on the outpatient level, meaning that they're not needing uh, individual care on a daily basis, but being able to meet maybe once a week uh, or twice a week. Some do work in school settings. Uh, there has been an uptick of school districts uh, contracting with uh, private practices or group practices to have clinical mental health counselors be staffed in the schools uh, to work alongside school counselors. Um, we've also seen individuals working with government agencies and in community service boards. Um, uh, there's been uh, some students that have worked with military populations. There's some struggle, though, just still with uh, on the uh, the landscape around working at things like Veterans Affairs. LCPCs are able to work uh, at VA hospitals, uh, but we do still see a lot of social work and psychologists working in those settings. But we ha I, we have had some students go and uh, and work in uh, in veteran hospitals as well. So, uh, but there's really a broad area of where our students go on to work. Um, college counseling centers. Um, some students go on to work in other capacities through advocacy or lobbying as well. Um, but there's some, uh, there's a large breadth of where people apply um, their knowledge and where they do take on in the field. So we can go on to the next slide. Yeah, student research. Because um, again, we have a lot of our students that are really interested in doctoral study um, after uh, they graduate from the program, either going right in or um, taking some time to work in the field for a year or two before going on to that PhD process. Um, so we always get asked questions about opportunities for um, student research. Um, and the answer to that is absolutely yes. As a matter of fact, Dr. Travis and I are part of a research group that works with one of our former students. And I'm uh, part of another research group that works with a former student and a current student that we have um, in our master's program. And like us, we have many other faculty members that have um, these research programs. Sorry, the sun's coming in from the behind me. Um, so we have lots of those opportunities, not only within our program, but within the School of Education. 
there's often announcements about, you know, we're going to start this research study. We're looking for people that want to be a part, you know, of this research team. So there are plenty of opportunities um, within the School of Education to get involved um, in specific research. Um, also, as part of our program, you will take a research methods course. Um, so for many folks that are really interested in that, a lot of my students that have taken the research course have developed their actual research proposal into a project um, and have gone on to present this project or write papers about it. So those are other opportunities um, that are there for students if they're really interested in conducting that research. Yeah, I just wanted to, to chime in on that as well, Dr. Gonzalez, is that with the student research side of things, I think that there's there's faculty that are that do reach out and give opportunities, but there's also, I've had many students that do uh, connect with the larger Hopkins community. Um, I've had some students connect with research labs in the hospital, um, in the Department of Psychology. Uh, there's a lot of different research labs as well that are conducting research that students can become involved in. Um, and when faculty have resources to connect those, they'll help out and uh, in, in, in getting those connections. Some of the, the School of Public Health um, and things along those lines. I just recently uh, uh, finished the portion with student research working in a collaborative research project with the, uh, the School of Public Health uh, Bloomberg and, and students were involved in that as well as also um, coming from the research course. Uh, there's also students have the opportunity uh, to develop if they would like and they can find a faculty member to sponsor them and doing an independent research project as one of their electives. Uh, and that as a student reaching out to faculty that would sponsor them uh, and designing pretty much a research project that they would work on uh, with the supervision of that faculty member if it's an area of focus of uh, of yours as a student if you're if you're admitted uh, and so am i covering the doctoral studies uh Gonzalez? Mm -hmm. yeah and so with doctoral programs uh, there's uh, many students do have an interest in pursuing doctoral programs. Some want to go directly into the field. Some do want to continue their education and, uh, and we're able to set you up in both areas. Uh, with doctoral studies, um, a lot of our students, because of where our degree is seated in a KCREP program, uh, it flows very nicely into a PhD in counselor education and supervision. Uh, that degree in itself focuses in on continuing to develop uh, clinical practice and clinical skills uh, as well as also developing an individual specifically in areas of supervision, so working as a supervisor to supervise clinicians that are coming into the field, as well as components of teaching in a factorial role, or uh, as well as also conducting research. Uh, I have some students that have uh, sought out and applied to clinical psychology and counseling psychology programs as well uh, as some PsyD programs, uh, as well as uh, students working in uh, student affairs as well have been some of the other areas that we've seen uh, students go on to pursue PhD uh, level studies, but that's also something that your faculty and your advisor would work with you in writing, writing letters of recommendation or reviewing your personal statements uh, and also discussing to you because within the world of mental health, there's a lot of different titles uh, with social work, psychology, counseling, of trying to navigate what would be the fit in the areas of what you're trying to look at to make an impact of using your, uh, your doctoral studies. And so there's a lot of guidance and support from faculty if students do choose to go that route. Slide. Yeah, so let me talk a little bit about uh, Chi Sigma Iota, our um, International Honor Society, Counseling Honor Society. It's part of our program, the Lambda Chapter. Um, we have a student run program um, that uh, has a lot of sort of like the student voice and advocacy arm for students um, within our counseling program. Um, one of the most incredible things that they do um, is a mentorship program. So, so many of our students, when they come into the program are automatically assigned a mentor if they want. Um, and this is a student that is, um, uh, you know, senior, more senior level within the program to sort of guide them through those first couple of semesters for the kinds of questions that an academic advisor couldn't answer um, or maybe a faculty member couldn't answer. Um, there are also so many things that they do in terms of social events. Um, you know, this is obviously before COVID. Now we've got a little bit of restriction on that, but, you know, social events, practice sessions for um, exams, um, study sessions, uh, uh, oftentimes they collect data from students in terms of, you know, what are, what are students interest in learning more about, and they will bring someone to do some professional development. So this is our only student led organization. Um, and uh, it is something that we like to highlight as part of our program. Oh, okay. Thank you. For, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Herbie for having me.
Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jin Won, and I'm currently in the second year of clinical mental health counseling program. I'm um, also in a part of student organization that the Dr. Gonjal has introduced before that about the Chi Sigma IOTA, and I'm a position of as an international student representative. Um, okay, so the reason why I choose and love about Johns Hopkins counseling program is be the diversity of the program. Our professors put a lot of emphasis on diversity and multiculturalism in counseling, not focusing on just sore, racial, ethnic, or sexual characteristics. Our program respects the diverse identities and leads us to, to be multiculturality competent. Also, evidence-based various curriculums from our professors prepare us to become um, more educated and to be more competent before we graduate and dive into the field experiences. So by speaking of the field experiences, I think that field experiences in practicum and internships, it's just, you know, like school, clinical or, or hospital settings are great, great opportunities for counseling students to experience what and how exactly school and clinical mental health counselor work in the real world situation. And so about some out, out, advice for prospective students based on my um, experiences during Hopkins counseling program, um, I would say stay connected with faculty members and colleagues. Like your future colleagues and professors will be great support for you to develop yourself in the profession. Also, um, some of you might apply for the graduate program directly from undergrad and others might have other experiences in related or different fields. I also graduated undergrad like two years ago and came into the program directly. So I would like to say that don't, do not get intimate, intimidated in advance. Like you and your colleagues are on the same page and, and you won't be the only one who might come from the difficulties when you're studying in this program. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Travis for the wonderful presentation. So we're gonna continue by going over the application requirements. So applicants must submit a completed application which can be found on the school's website. The application fee is $80. Next, we need official transcripts, including institutions you may have taken courses but did not receive a degree. And next, a 500 word essay must be uploaded. You will need a current resume or CV two letters of recommendation. And if you're unable to have one academic letter of recommendation, we will accept two professional letters of recommendation. And please note the GRE is not required for this program. And lastly, if selected, a group a virtual interview is also required. There are a few additional steps you need to take in order to complete the application process. If you're an international student, you must submit a TOEFL or IELTS score. And if your degree was completed outside of the US, you will need to complete a course by course evaluation. Additional information can be found on the school's website. And the tuition for the 2021-2022 academic school year is $891 per credit. And please note, this excludes textbook, course materials, graduation fee, and registration fee. Additional fees apply and are charged separately from tuition. We encourage you to view our tuition fees page on the school's website for the most up-to-date information on tuition and fees. And if you're interested in applying for financial aid, we strongly encourage you to uh, apply for financial aid when you start your application. And we do offer a very limited number of partial need-based scholarship for fall semester. Please visit the school's website for any questions relating to financial aid or grants and scholarship. Thank you for attending today's virtual webinar. At this time, we would like to open up the floor for questions. And thank you, Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Travis for answering some of the questions. I know we're cutting pretty close to time. So um, Tyreen, let me know, um, feel free to go ahead if there were some questions that were not answered during the presentation. Yes, so what is the average age and average age and range in ages of your student body? Our students range in age from right graduating from a traditional coming out of high school into undergraduate 
23 all the way to students we've had in their mid 60s. Um, so we've had students in all age ranges as part of the program. Okay, next question. Do international students have a hard time getting placed for internships or even after? Uh, after, I mean, I'll speak on the school side. Um, definitely, uh, as far as getting, uh, having any challenges getting placed, absolutely not. Um, as long as they abide by whatever the district state in terms of work that they need to do before, in terms of criminal background check, et cetera, before um, they get into the schools. Um, but we haven't had any problems. Okay, and are these programs considered as STEM and offer international students with three years of OPT? So that question probably will have to go to our international students office. I don't have the response to that one. Yeah, I think that probably they would be able to get more clarity around the, the OTP components. This was a question um, asked previously um, with the with one of the students I spoke to as an admissions um, pre-phone pre call. And um, the program coordinator stated that, th that this program is not set up as STEM and does not meet the requirements for the international OPT. So I did receive that answer about a, two weeks ago. And um, a question that was, uh, again, uh, I'm not sure if this was answered, but from Nisha, could you elaborate how trauma and grief counseling is integrated throughout the curriculum, if not taught in one specific course? Sure, I'll speak on the school side and foundations of school counseling. We have an entire module on trauma theory um, and grief in schools and leadership in schools. We talk about the practicality of crisis intervention plans. Um, what trauma-informed care looks like within school systems. In practicum, you have a, um, a, a trauma interview um, that you do with clinicians in the field in terms of um, uh, what, are the, what are the crisis plans for different schools, how do they embed trauma-informed care in their school, et cetera. Um, Dr. Travis, if you want to speak on this. I was going to say, yeah, there's there's modules that are integrated into uh, internship and practicum specific to, to crisis response um, and trauma. Uh, there also is our specific modules and courses around suicidality. Um, we also do have a uh, an elective that is offered um, on crisis intervention. Uh, and so that's an elective that some students do uh, choose to take. Uh, and so that's um, that's also uh, an option. So it's not it's. Uh, I would say in every course, there's a piece of the trauma component that is brought in, um, but there are some specific areas where it's really highlighted. Thank you. The next question we have is, um, there was one about letters of recommendation. Uh, you would need two letters of recommendation. Another one I'm seeing from Betsy is, Dr. Travis, I know that you mentioned that students take a cognitive behavioral therapy course, but are encouraged to explore other theories as well. Does the clinical mental health program have a cognitive behavioral theoretical orientation overall? That's a really good question, um, and the short answer is no. Um, there's, it's it, that course really one of the areas of why we have that course is because, in insurance reimbursement language, as well as also the, the integrative nature of cognitive behavioral approach, is one of the the areas that we just have some specialty training that is that is brought in through that course. Um, we have faculty from many, many, many different theoretical backgrounds. Uh, as when they were talking about my research interest, I come from uh, an individual psychology or an Adlerian perspective. We have faculty that work from a feminist perspective, psychodynamics, some that do work from a cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, theory, therapy model. But there's a broad range of, of theories that are introduced and students, uh, we intentionally do not limit uh, students to thinking that they're coming in to be trained exclusively in one modality. Um, the cognitive behavioral approach is brought forward in that way just because primarily the re uh, insurance reimbursement as well as also for licensure in the state of Maryland, um, there is an advanced component of learning about cognitive behavioral therapy. And so that's why it's integrated in that way. That's not to in any way downgrade cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a very useful theory, but students definitely are encouraged and are introduced to many different theoretical modalities through faculty discussion, but then also through coursework. It's not, uh, it's definitely not a cognitive behavioral uh, program. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Travis. So the next question is, do all of the recommendations have to be returned completed before the application submit, before the applicant submits the application? 
And I can answer that. Um, first, just going back to the recommendation letters, the requirement is two, but the system does allow you to add additional recommenders if that is what you desire. But just keep in mind that for the additional recommenders that you add, it becomes a part of your admissions requirements. And so your application will not move to the next phase unless all admission requirements are received, materials are received. And in terms of having to submit your application prior to recommendations, the answer is you do not have to wait till you get those recommendation letters back and upload it to your application. As long as you fill out the application in its entirety, include your essay um, slash CV, I'm sorry, resume CVs in essay and complete the application in its entirety and pay the $80 application fee, you can certainly submit at that time. And then as your recommendation letters and transcripts come in, they'll automatically be uploaded to your account. And so the next question is what type of academic scholarships are offered? I can also answer that. So SOE offers an endowed scholarship, which is a needs-based scholarship. Anyone is eligible to apply, but you do have to fill out the FAFSA. That's how they determine the need and the monies that are awarded range from $500 to $1,500 per term. The application usually opens up early in the year and uh, there's a couple of months um, where students can apply to determine whether or not they will get the scholarship. Thank you, Tyrene. Um, the next question, actually, one thing I would like to note is that Jin Wan, he just um, shared his email address and he, thank you for doing that. He is one of our counseling student ambassadors and more than happy to uh, chat with you. Um, the next question I'm seeing is, would not having a professor letter of recommendation hurt our application? Um, and instead having two professional letters. Uh, so uh, no, it would not hurt your chances at all. If, uh, if again, if you need to submit two professional references, um, that is allowed. And the next question we have from Hannah is, what are the things you think make a student thrive in this program? Work with your advisor, work with your advisor, work with your advisor would be if I can say that three times. Um, but that's but really knowing that your advisor is a big advocate for you and being able to work with them and then communicating with faculty members um, really openly around your needs, but then also being able to just kind of communicate with them, I think is a really important component. Um, I don't think that it necessarily you need to come into the program saying, I'm going to work with this population. This is the exact way I'm going to be doing things. If you are in that position, that's great. But if you're also coming into the program, I have many students that come in and say, I, I don't know if I want to work with kids or if I want to work with adults. And I'm really trying to explore all of those. And that's a perfectly fine place to be, uh, to be looking at it with kind of an open learner's mind. Um, but I think working with uh, your advisor and working specifically on your program plan are really important component, components that I would say. I don't know if you have anything to add, Dr. Gonzalez. As far as thriving in the program, being open um, to the profession, this program is, uh, this program is a lot about you people going to counseling to fix other people. Um, and really it's about um, looking at, taking a good hard look at yourself. And if you're open and willing to do that, then you will thrive in this program. Um, if you're resistant to it, you will struggle um, in this program. I also think that having an open mind for feedback, uh, being uh, open to diversity of thought um, is another way to thrive in this program. All right, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, and if your question was not answered, uh, feel free to um, send your question to anything admissions related, my uh, colleague Tyrene, anything program related, here's the contact information for the academic program coordinator, Kiana. Thank you again for your interest in the Johns Hopkins School of Education. And thank you again for Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Travis for your time and the wonderful presentation. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.